Welcome, I'm Pam Larecchia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Susan Walker. Hi, Susan. Hi. <laughs> now, we have been connected online for a while now and I'm really excited to dig deeper into your unschooling journey. And to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and what everybody's interested in right now? That's always fun to hear. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we live in, in Argentina, in the Patagonia uh, part of Argentina. Uh, my husband's Argentine and I'm from the U.S. We met in, in graduate school in the U.S. and we moved down here 27 years ago. And we're both conservation biologists um, and we've been working on wildlife conservation in Patagonia for all these years. Uh, we have a daughter who's 26 and she went through 16 years of school here because there's three years, she had three years of kindergarten and then 13 years of regular school. So she had a lot of school <laughs> and when she finished, um, she decided she wanted to go to college in the U.S. So she went up there, graduated a couple of years ago and decided to stay. But um, she and her boyfriend are gonna come down as soon as they open the borders and, and let them in. They're gonna come down and stay here for about a year. So we're all very excited about that. Uh, to have her closer again for an extended period of time. And we're fixing up the garage apartment for them. Um, she is a storyteller and a writer, and she has been from the very, very beginning. Um, and now she writes uh, young adult uh, fantasy novels. And her third, well, actually, I think her third and fourth should be coming out pretty soon. Um, and uh, she also loves music and singing and she and her boyfriend are really into Dungeons and Dragons now, and they're excited about getting us into it when they come down here. So uh, we've got something really to look forward to. Um, and then we have a 13-year-old son um, who has really a very special little blessing to us because he came along when we thought, you know, when we were in our mid-40s and we didn't know if we'd be able to have another child. So. Um, he's 13 now and he's really into what I come to call economy games where, uh, he collects resources or currency depending on the game and, uh, figures out how to use those in the best way to reach whatever the goal of the game is. And, uh, that he does that with video games and also board games and card games. Um, you know, like Monopoly is the one that everybody knows about but he's he really likes that kind of thing um he also likes uh sort of quest or adventure games that he can do online with his friends like terraria um and uh he he likes to take these really deep dives into uh, like big epic story arcs that could be a series of movies or tv shows or books and um this is something new for him, actually. He just started last year, I would say. But right now, he's in the middle of Harry Potter. He's totally into Harry Potter, listening over and over again to um, the thousands and thousands of words that uh, are in the <laughs> Harry Potter uh, audible books. So um, that's what he's into now. Um, my husband, is he's still very passionate about um, his conservation work. And lately, he's been really busy with um, the construction of the uh, apartment. And so that's kept up most of his free time, but he's he's also really into gardening and plants and he makes the inside and outside look pretty for us. So, and um, I, in, in my uh, time, I like to spend, well, lately what I'm doing is spend a lot of time reading about uh, neuroscience and psychology topics, um, consciousness, things like that, and, uh, and, and health also. And then, when the um, pandemic started, I got myself a ukulele <laughs> and I've been learning to play the ukulele and I have a lot of fun with that. So that's sort of us right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love that piece. Just toss that in there. You know what? Ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> it is so fun to just start something new, something fresh, right? Yeah. Like you're totally starting from scratch. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. I love uh, the Harry Potter listening. I, I remember Lissy. Um, and it was in around those years too, you know, nine through 12, 13, 14, um, mm-hmm. listening to the audiobooks and then and then reading the books and diving into forums on like there's just a whole world in there. But yeah, some people are into the fan fiction piece. And at the time, the last um, few books hadn't been released. So there was also, you know, getting into that anticipation and everything. We did that with our, da- our daughter. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, they're actually the same age. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, it's so fun to see how that plays out for each. And I love that you notice the connection between all his different games. Uh, that that economy piece, right? And and seeing it in the video games he's choosing and the board games and the card games. So that he is pursuing that genre through so many different lenses and I'm sure getting different pieces from, from the different ways to go through it. So that is super cool too. In your journey, because I know you had said you were uh, trained and worked as a conservation biologist for many years and you're transitioning now to to finding some new interests I just I I love hearing a little a little snapshot just tells us so much and even just says you know it's okay to change yeah that we're interested in right to move in new directions no matter what our age it's it's fascinating stuff yeah yeah (laughs) definitely (laughs) it's scary and really uh exciting right because, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and I'm sure it is at most ages. And there I've seen it in, in my kids, and I know I've heard about it. Like in that transit, that transition time can be challenging because you know you're kind of pulling away from something that you were not you literally, I'm the general you, but if this was your experience, pulling away from something that you were passionate about and deeply engaged in for a longer period of time, and maybe don't quite yet know. You just know that that's not as exciting anymore, but you don't quite yet know where you're going. So there's this kind of cocooning phase that often happens as you're just exploring little things. Uh, I remember the quote, I think it's Leo Tolstoy, um, boredom is a desire for desires. It's kind of that stage where you'd love to have something that you're equally passionate and excited about, but it, sometimes it can take a while to kind of explore and find where that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and for me, it's not the first time in my life, I think, that I've sort of remade myself. And I don't know if you've ever heard uh, this concept. I think it's uh, it was a Polish psychologist. I think his name was Dabrowski uh, that came up with this concept of um, uh, positive disintegration. Yes, yeah. Yeah, have you read about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think... Uh, that's sort of I'm going through right now um, so yes yeah. interesting <laughs> yeah it's very cool it's very cool I mean it's hard sometimes in the midst of it but you know when you can step back and give yourself the space mm-hmm. through it it also helps us do the same thing for our kids right and sometimes it's opposite we've given it to our kids and it's like oh I should give that grace to myself as well <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, I think that's what I'm going to talk about you know the today with the questions that you told me you were going to ask me that um yeah yeah I hadn't thought about well yeah I have to some extent but um but yeah it's a process I've been going through with my kids and myself so yeah. that's so cool so yes when we connected about our call and and what uh, things you might be interested in talking about you shared that there were four big paradigm shifts that were instrumental for you on your unschooling journey and I thought it would be awesome to dive into those because I love hearing what shifts, what pieces of the puzzle were um, larger aha moments for people on the journey. So let's start with learning. What big paradigm shift around learning happened as you started exploring and schooling? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, to say at the beginning that um, that nothing I'm going to say is like some new uh, thing 
it's my insights and my path and the, the takeaway things that I've gotten uh, from all the digging I've been doing that's, that have worked for me. And of course, everybody's path is very unique and different. That's the amazing, wonderful thing about uh, unschooling. So um, I just wanted to share mine and uh, not say that I'm saying this is the way I think people have to do it or anything because there's, <laughs> the things about unschooling is that there's no, well, I'll get to that here. There's no way to do it. So um, so I'll start with that, with the learning to see what we had to shift from. And uh, I am super schooled, a very schooly because um, I really love the academic part of school. I did very well, uh, although I did drop out of high school, but not, you know, that was for other reasons. And I went on to college and, and graduate school. So I was very um, uh, like indoctrinated in school, in schoolish ways. And um, a lot of my self-esteem was wrapped up in, in school and how I did in school. And my husband's the same way. I mean, we met in graduate school. We were both um, very school people. <laughs> so, um, uh, but in spite of that, I, I did have some doubts about the whole thing um, because even though I liked the academics so much, like I said, I dropped out and I dropped out when I was 15 and then I went on and I did just fine in college and, um, and, and graduate school. So, you know, I was like, what did I miss? It, you know, it was those three years that I should have done of high school. You know, what was the point? And then my sister, uh, my sister, <laughs> my daughter, um, she was also very good in school and um, uh, didn't have any problems academically. But one thing I noticed with her, and I don't know, maybe it was the same way when I was in elementary school and I didn't notice it because I was so focused on just doing what they told me to and doing it well. But I saw that so much of what they were asked to do was just pointless, busy work. Um, uh, and sometimes she would ask me about it. And I'm like, well, you know, you just, you just have to do it. <laughs> and uh, she always had her own big storytelling projects, you know, books to write and movies to make at home. And, um, and I just hated to have to send her to school every day when it, so much of it didn't seem like it was that uh, relevant for, for her. Um, but at that time, we didn't see any alternatives, and we had some rough patches, but we all slogged through, and she made it through. So um, then the shift was when my son came along, uh, but not at, at first, and we already had these doubts, but we didn't know there was anything else we could do, so we just sent him to school, you know, and um, fortunately, he didn't go until four-year-old class. He didn't start at three, but... Um, Anyway, when we saw that he just wasn't really happy in school, we were very fortunate that at that time there were um, several other families in the area that were also looking at, you know, for some alternatives maybe. And we got together to see about starting something else or homeschooling. And uh, even though I have several, uh, several advanced degrees now, I none of them were in teaching or education. So I never dreamed that I could homeschool my kids, you know, because I thought, well, I'm not qualified for that. Um, but some of these other parents started, they had seen some things about unschooling and got me started looking into that. And um, well, fast forward five years later and we're the only ones in town that are still homeschooling. <laughs> and we've been unschooling from the very beginning. Um, but it, we took him out after second grade. Um, but uh, it was pretty rough at, at first because you know I, I got it intellectually sort of from the beginning to some extent, but there was just so much de-schooling that we had to go through. And um, you know, my daughter's independent projects and what she was into, it was there were kinds of things that are that everybody you know approves of. It's kind of in a schoolish framework, it's like, oh, she's writing a book or, oh, she's making a movie, you know, that kind of thing. But my son, he was mostly interested in video games and YouTube videos. And uh, to be honest, that kind of freaked me out. At the, you know, at first I was like, I couldn't see um, or understand what he was learning from those things. And I was worried that he was falling behind. 
or that he wasn't doing anything productive. And um, it was uh, also really frustrating to me because I couldn't learn about unschooling the way I knew how to learn about things, you know. There was no book, uh, your, your books, it's been so long since I've read them, I can't remember them that well, but those little short books that you have, they have uh, five guidelines or something like that. They were very helpful, um, but nothing just told you, you know, I was used to being able to read and study about how to do something and then just do it, you know, and it doesn't work that way. You know? <laughs> like, a lot of uh, self-reflection, ex examination of what you believe and where it's coming from and a lot of work like that. So um, I found this podcast and I listened to it faithfully um, and I joined um, Sue Patterson's um, mentor group and every week talked with that group of people and with Sue and I did your Childhood Redefined Summit. Um, so I found lots of support online, fortunately, because you know I'm way down here. And I just had to hear over and over and over again about a different way of seeing things, different ways of doing things. Um, so it was really uh, fascinating to me for myself to see, I noticed like about a year or so into it, it's like, wow, I, I'm doing this, I'm learning in a very different way. So that was one of the big uh, um, ahas about the learning. Uh, but at the same time, uh, homeschooling here in Argentina is theoretically legal, but it's not done much and there's no uh, regulation or laws, which sounds, maybe it sounds good to some people, but you're living in a gray area, an illegal gray area. And you do hear stories very rarely about um, problems with that. So I wanted to make really sure that I could be clear uh, about what we were doing and why and justify it if anybody, you know, if the authorities came. So I also dug into it a lot the way I know how to do things like that by researching learning theory and um, and uh, I really looked into uh, justifying learning by play and self-directed learning and the kinds of things you learn from uh, video games and even socializing. I was worried about that because my uh, the bulk of my son's uh, socializing was online. And I was really surprised about how much research there is out there about all those things. There's a lot that's been done. And um, I was able to put together an educational plan that's documented you know, with research the way I know how to do things like that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, one of the things um, that was most interesting to me was to see about uh, learning from video games and in school of course we're so focused on the content and subjects and you can't really see that in in video games a lot of times although you do get surprisingly a lot amount of content depending on what game you're, you're playing but but they do teach these skills that uh, most uh, educators and um, people in the business world and everything now are thinking are really important that schools don't touch and they are they're things like I wrote them down because I they're things that we're not used to thinking about like decision tree style thinking situational awareness dimensional reasoning things like that and in in addition the the online games where you're working with teams all the time you have to build all the collaborating skills and uh, carrying out a project from the beginning to the end so Anyway, I got together this uh, educational plan that uh, that I feel really good about and that also explains why we don't have curriculum, uh, a set curriculum and how we do assessments, which <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like I'm sure if you sat him down and tested him with standard testing, he'd probably be below grade level or not at grade level. But if you sit him down and talk to him, you would find a very articulate, very um, well-informed young fellow who uh, is very strategic in his thinking and very critical. He, all the, 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 the books, the video games, everything that he consumes, the YouTube videos, he, he analyzes and puts them into context. And um, so I had to learn to see 
how he learned in a different way and learn about him, sort of study him. And um, so that was, that's been the other big fascinating piece um, to see that he learns differently, that he's able to learn and, uh, and also uh, in my own learning, it's been a big shift. Wow. Oh, I love that, Susan. Thanks for sharing that detail. Like for me, it was, it's, it's so interesting to see. I love the way you took what you were curious or unsure about and came at it with the lens of your strengths, right? Mm -hmm. Because you knew how to put, put a plan together, you know, and yeah. then, and then as you were putting that together, you came across each of these things, like, like coming up with educationese words to describe what he's doing. So that was you hanging out with him and seeing what was going on with those games and realizing so much of the learning that was happening in there. So through that, then you could take that back to your lens and put it in your language, a language that you were comfortable in, you know, that if ever anybody had questions, I can now, I can now feel comfortable that I can describe this lifestyle in a way that they're more likely to understand what's happening. Yeah. And also your piece about, um, about the difference between grade level and looking at him as a person. Like I've always found that so fascinating and it's that transition away from grade levels as the most important indicator of how well a person is developing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And the understanding, even what you said from your experience, you know, with your daughter and with yourself leaving school for a couple of years. And it's like, you know, what did I even miss? All those pieces, I think, came together to help you realize um, that those grade level indicators were just a thing. They're more a product of the system itself versus the person. And when you sat down with your son and you chat with him and you, you just enjoy him as a person and you can see how important and valuable um, the way he's learning. Like you said, he has a very different learning style, but mm -hmm. however it is, he's pulling these things together and he is um, growing a picture of the world and very articulate, intelligent, just a real, a real engaging person in front of you, right? And that's so much more valuable than what scale and the grade level average thing, because he's not living that life. He's not in that classroom. You know, yeah. that, that is valuable because that's the assessment scale for the classroom and the school system. But when you're outside of that, if you try to bring, it just doesn't mesh when you try to bring those uh, assessment indicators into the life that you're living and you have the opportunity to engage with your child who's standing there right in front of you <laughs> and it's just so amazing the person they're becoming right yeah yeah and those grade level things and the um and and the grades you just see that they're as pointless as the busy work that my daughter was having to do you know it's like it's just so irrelevant um to where he really is and to who he is. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great. I loved hearing your your journey through that. So another big paradigm shift you experienced was around the idea that it's okay to be who you are. And you kind of touched on that, you know, with his different learning styles and that kind of stuff, but it is a much bigger picture shift. So I was hoping you could share what that looked like for you. Yeah. Um, well, when I was thinking about what the biggest shifts I had to make to make were, um, I was I was really surprised at what some of them were because you think, really, that was a shift, you know. So this was probably the biggest one, or one of the biggest ones. All the next three actually are pretty. <laughs> where you think, okay, it's okay to be who you are. I mean, not only am I pretty sure I believe that before I, it was like one of my core values that um, I really believe that each person was individual and unique and that, that people should be respected and valued for who they are. So it was really, really shocking to me when I got to the realization that how much work I still had to do in, in that area. Cause that's the one thing, you know, I saw sort of my whole defining a big defining part of who I was, I thought. 
Um, and I started to realize that I was um, uh, judging or sort of valuing some characteristics, characteristics of my kids or behaviors. And that that was based on this internal gauge that I had myself about what I had determined when I was little um, was valuable or bad about me, uh, one or the other. And that I was projecting that onto my kids, you know. So I realized that if I really wanted to honor and accept them, that I had to, and especially because the things that I noticed that I was trying to control and change the most with things that I didn't like about myself, you know. So in order to honor and respect and them, I had to honor and respect myself. Um, and uh, well, one of the things that really helped me uh, because of the kind of people that, that we are was um, learning about highly sensitive people. Mm -hmm. um, when my son was in kindergarten, um, and there were a lot of things that he didn't like about the kindergarten that the other kids liked. Um, and uh, about that time I read, or I discovered that book, um, The Highly Sensitive Child by Elaine Aaron. Mm -hmm. And and I read that and it was like, uh, oh, okay. Not only was that him, it was also me and my daughter, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, I had read um, Quiet by Susan Cain a few years before that. Uh, and that started me to see that a lot of the opinions that I had about some characteristics of, of myself, of introversion um, and being a quiet person, quiet introspective person, that, that I was carrying some values about that that were common in our society that we weren't as valued. Um, so that had helped me sort of start seeing that, that the, I really identified so much more with this concept of a highly sensitive person because it's not just introversion, or, you know. It's a um, there's so much to it, <laughs> yeah. and um, so seeing that, starting to read stuff about that, it helped me um, start to see and accept a lot of things about myself that I had seen as shortcomings or faults. And you know, it's like <laughs> they they are. It's part of who we are, and sometimes there are strengths. Um, so, uh, yeah, only about 20% of the population is supposed to be supposedly highly sensitive, which doesn't seem that small to me. But, um, but it is obvious that schools and a lot of other things are, are built around that other 80%. Um, and my son's kindergarten, they started every day with this big gathering and assembly, like uh, with all the classes came together and they had lots of cheery music that was supposed to be exciting, you know, and motivating for the kids, but for my son and also for me, <laughs> it was like, it was so overwhelming. The music was too loud and the energy, instead of excitement, um, it was like frenetic. I mean, that's the way I experienced it. I'm pretty sure that's the way my son was experiencing it, experiencing it too. And so they would have all this thing together and then, uh, usually the parents stayed for that. Um, and then uh, you would go, the kids would line up with their teacher and go to their classroom. Uh, the first few days, they let the parents go with the kids. Um, and and all, almost all parents would go the first day and then every day more and more would drop off. And by the second week, most of them weren't going. Well, I always sent my husband because, you know, I wasn't comfortable in that situation either. So I didn't take Mauro very much, but um, about two months into the school year, uh, my husband was traveling and I had to take him. And so the assembly was over and we lived through it. And then we go to the, he wanted me to go with him to the room still. And I knew my husband was doing that. So I went with him and I felt a little, awkward, you know, because there weren't a whole lot of other people doing that. But when we got to the room, there were three other parents in there. And I had just read the book or had started reading it. And I did this uh, calculation in my head there. And it's like, okay, there's four of us. That's 20% of the class. So yeah, that's totally normal, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, the teachers, they were really understanding about that first adaptation period, you know. But after two months, not all of them, there were a, a couple that were really, really good. And uh, 
uh, and understanding. But in general, the teachers sort of thought that if this was still going on at two months, that you were just sort of babying your kid, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, to be honest, I, I, that's what I was thinking too, you know, uh, before I read that book. Um, they couldn't understand why any kid wouldn't like the assembly, why they'd be overwhelmed by it. I wasn't really clear on what was going on in my head either. Um, and the only, they could just think it was just a fault with the child or the parent, you know. And I realized eventually, you know, that even though I grew up on the other side of the world, that I had internalized these same types of judgments. And to, to me, I, I, I just felt like a failure. I transmitted my my own failures to my kids through either bad parenting or just, you know, my bad example. Um, so it, I realized, you know, that even though I was really accepting of other people, I wasn't accepting of myself. Um, and I discovered that I had some pretty deep uh, wounds that I needed to heal. And my son is really the one who's helped me so much with that. Excuse me if I get pretty teary-eyed in this part, but um, so I I was fortunate that I came from a family that was mostly highly sensitive people. So at home I was okay, but out in the you know at school and in the world you get these messages all the time, and especially back then. Maybe it's changing now with those new things about highly sensitive people and the and Susan Cain stuff, the whole, people are more aware of these things, but back, you know, when I was growing up, it was just like, there was something wrong with you if you, you know, if you were, you know, shy or something like that. And unfortunately, of course, highly sensitive people are just like um, extremely uh, sensitive to those social cues. So it goes really deep. And uh, when I started seeing my little guy, uh, you know, start to box up his his spirit and put up those defenses and walls. It just broke my heart, <laughs> and it also it broke my heart for him and it broke my own little heart. You know, the little girl inside of me. Um, and I was in my mid forties, like I said, when he was born. I uh, I had a rocky adolescence and early twenties, but by the time he was born, I had I was successful in on my own terms in my career and had a very nice wonderful family and was a productive member of society you know so things were okay it's not that I was you know I wasn't even aware that I had any problem really um so uh if he hadn't come along I probably would have gone on like that and I would have been just fine I'm not saying that there was any major thing that I you know um but he did come along and he showed me that there were these things that needed healing that have just enriched my own life so much. Um, so like my daughter, she was also highly sensitive, of course, like I mentioned, um, but she was more compliant and uh, also at the same time in, more independent in some ways. And, and I think my husband and I were at a different point in our lives, so it just didn't it didn't generate any uh, conflict that needed to be resolved at the time. We just tootled along. But then my son, he just, uh, they're both, of course, extremely perceptive that he would throw everything back to me, you know, and he could see, uh, or he always knew when that, what I was saying didn't jibe with what was inside. You know, and he just made it so clear to me. <laughs> it was very humbling, you know, when I decided to listen to him, um, he would always let me know uh, when things weren't in line with my values or, you know, when things weren't um, jiving. So he's been such a teacher in that respect. Um, he's exposed a lot of deep feelings uh, in me and helped me identify a lot of uh, motivations and things going on inside that I just didn't know were, were going on in there under the surface. So, um, yeah, the, and then that we have in common that we're both uh, highly sensitive, but that's only one part of our personalities, of course. And he's got a lot of other parts that are very, very different from me. And uh, that's 
sometimes been a challenge to accept or learn that, yeah, he responds differently, reacts differently to things, chooses different things to do than I do, but he's a different person and that is okay. And um, so, and, and not less valuable, even though it's not schooly. Um, and I got so much, I think, out of the, uh, the Childhood Redefined Summit related to this. Uh, you guys talked a lot about acceptance. And uh, I was thinking, this is sort of my take on that. I realized that uh, saying that it's okay to be who you are is the same as saying uh, accepting who you are and who your child is. So. That's such... <laughs> I loved how you started the whole thing saying it seems like such a simple thing, right? That it's okay to be who you are, that we are all individuals, right? Like that is something I think that most people believe, but there are so many layers to that. Right? There's an actual depth to that, that I just love how you, how you dug into that and shared that piece because because when we see it in our our kids and like like you were talking about with with the summit really accepting them the, i think one of the big steps is not just saying that's okay they're different from me it's what what you mentioned that it's just as valuable for them as the right. way i am is valuable for me mm -hmm. right that is another layer that we can get to that helps us dig into this it's okay to be because when you stay on the surface, it's okay to be that, you know, but we can still have those layers as you were talking about. But, you know, um, like we learned growing up being, being highly sensitive, but it's, it's not as good, right? We, we get the messages that it would be better if we we're something else, right? So yeah, yeah it's okay, you're, but, but it's a disappointment maybe. <laughs> you know? But if you could be this, it would be so much better. <laughs> But it's okay. <laughs> but those layers, as we dive through them, right, we come to see how truly valuable each person's unique makeup is to them, right? And for me too, I learned that really just through through my kids and through choosing to engage with them. And like you said, through realizing that this school experience just isn't working for him and being willing to try something else right mm -hmm. you know it's just valuing that enough and not to discount with your daughter and and her experience because I loved your point that it was it was the friction right you guys had tools with your daughter and managed to make it through without having to get to the level of this is so bad that we have to move to something else right mm -hmm. um all, all those journeys are, are totally, are completely valid for the people that were involved in each one of them. And, you know, so your son bringing this piece into your lives is so fascinating. And like you said, you, you know, you, you would have been fine. And now, or yet now, you have a depth of understanding of yourself that you didn't have before, right? Like so much, I love that idea that the reflection um, of, of accepting our children is really about accepting ourselves because so often the things that we worry about for our kids are the things that we see, the way we see ourselves reflected there and that we're disappointed in about ourselves so we, we don't want our child to go through that. Yeah, right? so, yeah, exactly. It's like I, I, didn't want them to be highly sensitive. You know, I didn't have the words for it at the time because I hadn't read stuff about that. Uh, but I didn't want them to have those things because they were painful for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and it just really encourages us. This is what we talk about so much of the de-schooling period is really our work. Um, but it's beautiful work. It is it is well worth the effort and the time and the space and the grace that we give ourselves to do this work because not only does it help us see our kids better, but it is so helpful for our personal growth um, in, in our own lives, right? And now we can show up more authentically as ourselves because we're learning more about us. And it's just this kind of spiral of goodness, 
right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy, you know, all that kind of stuff, but it's rich. It's a mm-hmm. rich spiral and, and it really helps us the, to each layer, each layer. There's, and I mean, that's one thing I've learned. There's always more layers. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> I'm finished now, but <laughs> <laughs> there's never a finish, sadly. <laughs> okay. So a third paradigm shift that you mentioned centered on the idea that everything changes. Now, again, this is going to be another layers conversation, right? Because on the surface, it's easy to say, yeah, 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 everything changes. People change, circumstances change, but there is a depth to that that really helps us. So how did that shift unfold for you and what did that look like? Yeah, um, well, like you say, it's one of those, again, that seems so obvious, uh, but I, um, it seemed to me that even though everybody says or anybody would say that things change, that when it comes comes to our children, a lot of times we don't behave like we're aware of that reality, you know. Um, and I saw that sort of in two ways. Uh, one is that I think um, that a lot of people seem to think that they need to recreate the child if they had a happy childhood or just the happy parts of their childhood that that's what their child needs that their child needs the education that they had when you're living in a world that's so different um, from what they were living in and they have resources and opportunities that are completely different um, and the education that we were led to believe you know was necessary for our um success or happiness, um, maybe it was or maybe it wasn't, but we really don't know what, um, because the, the how much things are changed and the, how the rate of change has even increased, uh, we don't really know what they are go- going to need. And um, I think this part of, uh, of it wasn't as hard for me, um, maybe because I was an older parent, and I'd seen so much change in already in my life, you know. Um, and when I was a kid, we didn't have computers in the house, you know, nobody had that. Um, uh, like my son always says, back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> uh, and also that I raised my children in a different country. Uh, so I knew that their childhood wasn't gonna be like mine. Um, and I, I sure I certainly shared things with them. I wanted to share things about my childhood that I really loved and um, and you know customs or books or movies and a lot of that doesn't translate really well into their worlds and didn't go over well. But a lot of it does, and they're interested, you know, in finding out more about what uh, life was like for me. Um, but the other area where I think we have trouble that I, again, I was just um, really su- surprised that it was that difficult for me was uh, to understand that what your child's doing right now is what they're doing right now, you know, and they change, the circumstances change, they change, and it doesn't mean what they're doing now is what they're going to do forever. Um, so I, I don't, I don't really know why that tripped me up so much, except for when I thought about it, it was like, it seemed like it was always related to some worry that I had about um, something like say, oh, he, he's, um, he's only eating bread. He doesn't eat anything but bread. So, you know, I start thinking he's going to ruin his health or something like that. But um, yeah, Sue Patterson, I have to give her credit for helping me a lot with that one because over and over and over again, I was in her group for Uh, several years and over and over and over again I had to hear her tell me or someone else who was worried about something and and was kind of getting into that space you know saying you know that's what they're doing right now but it doesn't mean they're going to do that forever you know (laughs) um and that just takes a lot of a lot of that weight off of the behavior um uh and when you can relax and let things unfold they do and um 
or maybe there's there's some things that may not change that may be really an integral part of who they are, but um, whether or not they change or not isn't the, the the issue. The important thing is that in the meantime, you don't have that scary little voice in your head and you're able to enjoy uh, and make the most out of what they are doing right now. So if he's eating only bread, then then you try to, you know, you buy all different kinds of bread or make different kinds of bread or see if he wants to help you make it or put different things on it. Um, and of course, offer him other things, not uh, assuming that he's not going to change or assuming that, uh, yeah, we got caught up in that a lot because we like, oh, we've learned this about him. Oh, he likes bread. That's all he likes. You can't assume that that's all he's ever going to like. So you still have to offer things and, um, you know, respect what he's where he's at right now, but also understand that it's, you know, just what he's in right now. And um, I think that that this shift is sort of um, another way of looking at that thing about living in the moment. You know, that um, um, trying to get and enjoy the most out of every moment instead of um, with thinking that things are that things never change and trying to recreate the past or control what happens in a future that may or may not ever get here. So um. that is such a big one. It was a big one for me too, because when we start to worry about something, we start to, you know, get in our head and it starts to spin and we do just project it into the future. It's like all oh, what ifs, what if, what if, you know, they're doing this forever and ever. What if they never, you know, when you, those are clues when you start to hear yourself using that kind of language to, to step back for a moment and realize that everything changes. And for a while, like I love what you did with, with your bread example, right? It's like there is a whole world of things inside something that's very narrow. Like you said, trying out all sorts of different styles of bread and, and, um, you know, maybe, and making your own, like just exploring inside that window with him, instead of feeling like everything's cut down, right? That we're just inside this narrow thing. And he's got this one, one thing that he likes. Yeah. So many times, like whether it, you know, anything, I, I saw a thread in, in the network earlier today, some, that somebody's really interested in ice cream. Oh my gosh, you know, there's so many different ways to play with that too, right? Within different flavors, different styles, making your own, you know, there's a whole world in there to explore as well. So once we can realize that the fear is getting us stuck into that, um, that fear that nothing's, that nothing's going to change, that they're going to eat this one thing, or they're going to do this one thing, or they're going to act this one way forever and ever, that that's just kind of our mind projecting. Um, and that truly everything changes, right? And then that's when, that's when you kind of relax a little bit, that weight falls off your shoulders a bit, and you can start exploring in the moment, like you said, getting back to the moment, because everything's okay in this moment. Right? Mm -hmm everything's okay in this moment. And you mentioned too, that some things are like in eight and, you know, maybe it will be something that's with them. Yet I do find too, over the years that even the context of that changes, right? You know, so often even, you know, a, a way it's expressed. So something that's in eight, as um, their their lives change, as they grow and change in pe as people, even these innate traits um, can change over time in, in the context, in the expression, you know, and also in how we understand it. It's like in figuring out how we tick, right? Yeah. So how we choose. Sometimes we choose to push our comfort zones for a little bit and see what happens. And sometimes we embrace them and kind of cocoon right into it, right? So that is the the really fun aspect of it. <laughs> When we can pass that fear and, and embrace that everything changes and and give it the space to change, right? So, you know, that we're not looking in the next couple of days, it needs to change in the next couple of weeks. But when we start looking back six months, we start looking back a year, five years, then you really start to see the context that, yeah, everything does change in 
really interesting ways that we won't know until we can look back, right? <laughs> so there's that piece of trust in there. Yeah, I like the way you said, uh, you know, give it the space um, because, um, yeah, that you give the moment the space, but also space the opportunity for change. Um, yeah, yeah. And as you were saying, both points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and as you were saying, even within the bread doesn't mean you're. If somebody's really interested in one thing, it doesn't mean you're closing off the rest of the world. Like right. other people are eating things other than bread. You know, there are other opportunities you can offer to share. You know, all all those does different pieces you can accept the moment and also be living your moment you're living your moment right there with them and your moment maybe includes more than those other things right so when there's not a judgment of them um, for their choices Mm -hmm. plus we're living our own own choices like they see that bigger world and they realize it's their choice and when when we're not judgmental of it they don't feel defensive about it is really yeah. what I've seen, right? And when they're feeling defensive about it, they're more likely to hold on tighter because they have to they have to show that power. It's like, no, no, I am, this is me, this is me, see me, see me, right? But when they're not defensive, then they they know that it's their choice. Without the defensiveness, they know it's a choice and that they could choose something different tomorrow and nobody's going to say, I told you so, or anything like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big one. Okay, so the last paradigm shift that you mentioned was to seeing radical love as the foundation of your unschooling lives. I really loved how you described that. So could you share with us how that shift came about and the difference that you've seen? Yeah, um, okay, again, this seems an obvious one that we all love our children very much we want what's we want I was about to say we want what's best for them and I think that's what we usually think uh we we want them to be happy and um and successful on their terms uh at least uh but I think so many times our own egos um and our internal internalized social judgments are um and, and the fears get in the way and we try to make them into what we think they need to be in order to be happy. And that comes out of, it comes out of love, of course. But when we do that, we're not really loving them and who they are um, as their own unique person. So um, yeah, I wanna say that this shift doesn't mean that I love him or my children more now than I did before. I always loved them the same, but I feel like now I love them better in a way that supports them uh, more as uh, as human beings. And actually in all my relationships, I think I've improved a lot in that way. And the the radical thing that I, that I said, I got, you know, I just read that book, um, The Body, the Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Taylor. I was reading it for the Living Joyfully Network. Uh, we, were, we had a book discussion about that. And um, there she presents all the meanings of radical and why she um, advocates this radical. And so, yeah, I wrote down here what she, the, some of the meanings of radical, this means foundational, referring to the origin, or something that exists inherently within a person or a thing. And, and so the way she describes how transformative having that radical love for yourself can be in your, your own life, I, it just kind of dawned on me, it's like, you know, this is what's been happening in our family. And uh, uh, that this is what's like the bedrock of the, of the unschooling life that we have that, and that, this this time of it required um, a level of trust and acceptance that I hadn't been able or or willing willing or able whatever to give before because of my own wounds and um, and fears you know so uh, that 
some of the work I did related to that, I would say in the in the very early days of the unschooling, I did this online course by Akila Richards um, called Radical Self-Expression. And uh, that kind of set me on that path, but it was so early that I, I was still sort of lost. I didn't really know where I was going with it. And then about a year later, I did the Childhood uh, Redefined Summit and that helped me a lot with that kind of uh, digging. So I'd say that those two things are the, the, the two experiences I had that helped me do the most ex really deep ex ex excavating and learning how to connect with myself and my children. And so, or at least they really got the ball rolling. So, um, yeah, I'm back to radical. Yeah, so Sonia and her book talks about radical self-love and you guys in the summit talked about radical acceptance and uh, uh, and Akilah's course was radical self-expression. And uh, it's a theme. And also a lot of people call, call this radical unschooling mm -hmm. and they use the same adjective, you know, radical. And uh, to be honest, you know, I always, I think my, my go-to meaning for radical is extreme and and that's not uh, that's not what it is and coming to understand that like the way Sonia was using it made me realize that that's just the essence of um, is what brings it all together it's uh, what's helped me heal uh, myself and my relationships and what's, and what makes um, unschooling work for us because it's like when your love is radical, it's the it's the foundation of your relationship with your child. And it's based on a love and acceptance of yourself and, and just an inherent trust and acceptance. Um, and I think when most of your most of your daily interactions start coming from from that bedrock or that foundation, then the unschooling, I'm gonna cry again now. <laughs> the unschooling flows. And uh, and the learning just bursts out, you know, and takes off, and your family is just more peaceful and fulfilled, um, and not perfect. And but when that's the foundation, that's what for us at least that's what really made it finally start um, finally all come together. So. I love the way you express that, Susan, like the foundation, it helps us move through the bumpy moments. Yeah. That, that you mentioned. And, and it also feels like all the other, like the other paradigm shifts that you were talking about and all those layers that we work through, like then you're, that's when you start to get into these foundational layers. Right. Mm -hmm. And talk about how in the end it it comes to be about the relationships right this love just kind of bubbles up and through everything and everything else like you said the learning it it just bursts out it just happens all around us we don't have to look for it we don't have to create it we don't have to test for it but we see it happening around us just with such joy and dedication and determination, even in the frustrating moments, even in the challenging moments. But it just becomes part of the fabric of, of our team, doesn't it? And yeah. I love, the, I love the way you went through um, Radical, too, and explained that. Because at first, for me, too, it just seemed like extreme. It's like, why do we have to? <laughs> Extreme, because in the end, this really seems to be how humans um, function really well, right? In this in this kind of space. But yeah, when you talk about it as the essence, as foundational, um, the the love and relationships, everything um, just blossoms out of that, doesn't it? Yeah, it seems like until we got there, that things. You know, when I talk about the learning happens, and I think some people may have a hard time seeing how that's related, but until we got there, I think all these other little things were in the way that inhibited some of that things, approaches, or things that my son would do, you know, because he always had in the back of his mind, probably thinking, oh, what's mama going to think about this, you know, 
Um, so you sort of have to get past that and free all that up in order to allow that um, really self-directed learning to happen. And I'd love, you know, earlier on, you mentioned, you know, I understood this intellectually, but that's the piece, like, you know, and some people right now may think, well, that sounds crazy. How do we get there? Because you can't just step there. You can't just say tomorrow, nope. radical <laughs> love, that's where we're starting, baby. <laughs> it literally is a journey, isn't it? You need to go, you need to find what for yourself are the big paradigm shifts, right? Because we're all unique. We come with a different set of experiences. So maybe some of the things that we talked about today were like, oh, I totally got that. But this thing over here is really challenging for me, right? Yeah. That's what I love about the podcast and talking to so many different people about their journeys because mm -hmm. different journeys and different pieces of people's journeys will connect with different people. But that the understanding that this is a journey that I'm taking, this is my journey. And yeah. to understand there's value in giving yourself the time and space and putting in the effort to peel back those layers, to do that self-exploration. In the end, and granted there is no end, we had that conversation too. There's always more layers um, because we're growing and changing because everything changes. Anyway, so <laughs> that's enough connections. but. We do eventually get to that radical love place where we can see it. It's not just an intellectual understanding, but it is a deep trust and, and um, something that we know in our bones that, that when we focus on this love and this foundation and keeping that at the forefront, we see all the rest of the stuff bubbling up. But you can't just step there intellectually tomorrow, right? No, not at all. <laughs> You know, I loved your book, The Unschooling Journey, and I read that, when I read that, I identified where I was, where I thought I was at that time, and I was maybe about the middle, you know, and I read the whole thing, and recently I went back to look because I feel like I did go through the rest of the arc, more or less, the way, I think it was really cool the way um, you identified the even though it's such a unique and individual uh, thing, you managed to find a, a common framework, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, that that was something. Yeah, I when I was diving into that, and and I just see it now more and more. You know, each time, each connection, that underlying framework, like we were talking about here, that that foundation. Um, it was just so fascinating for me. You know, that was something that really connected for me, um, mm -hmm. that, that framework, that underlying framework, because, and, and it was totally unrelated to unschooling. And that was based on the hero's journey. But as I was reading about that, because I was interested in story and, you know, character, hero's journey, like, that's how I first got there. So then I'm going like, unschooling, unschooling, unschooling. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's when I dove into that deep, deep hole. <laughs> But yeah, it's 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 fascinating the places that our lives take us, right? When you're here, just curious about something, right? It, like I started completely unrelated. You picked up the ukulele lately, you know. Yeah. It's just so fun to be okay with. You know what? I'm drawn to that. I have no clue why. We'll find out later, right? Some thread. It'll be like, oh, that's so interesting. But again, it's not till we look back and we start to see those threads through our lives. But yeah, the, and the whole point of, you know, curriculum and expectations is trying to put a path on somebody's future. But when we follow their curiosity and their interests and they can truly choose, they make some amazing choices that mm -hmm. you don't see till later. So yeah, I love that. That's so cool. All right. All right. So what is your favorite thing about the flow of your unschooling days right now? I think it uh, is that piece that, that I was talking about that, especially in this time right now when the whole world is, there's so much um, uh, chaos going on because of the pandemic. And, um, and we have our little peaceful island here. Uh, so I, I really, 
um, really thankful for that. And being stuck here with these, you know, the three of us here by ourselves, and we are just fine with that, you know. And specifically, like say for about the last month or so with the schedules that we've been on, been pretty opposite. So the specific, um, my favorite times of the day, I would say, are when we reconnect and we have two opportunities to do that because we're on such different schedules. So when we get up and then when our son gets up, those are like uh, reconnecting time that where we find out, you know, what we were doing, even though it's just been a few hours um, or what we're planning to do, what we're thinking and feeling. And they're just um, really just beautiful moments that I just noticed the other day how much it filled my filled my little heart to have those reconnects uh, um, every day. Yeah, yeah, just those moments. They're, they're so, they are, aren't they, right? They just fill us up, even it because it doesn't even matter what it is, but it's like that engagement with them. Mm. It's just sharing what we're interested in in the moment, what's passed our plates in the last little while. It just, it feels just so soothing, connecting, rich, even in the simplest things, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Susan. It was so much fun. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed enjoyed it. It was really good for me to, to think these things through. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you doing that. I love when the, the ideas that you came back with um, when we were talk, first talking about the call and these paradigm shifts. I thought that was just such a lovely approach. So I really appreciate you taking the time to think that through. That was awesome. And before we go, where can people connect with you online? Um. Well, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. I don't post anything hardly, but you can reach me through private messaging there if you want, or by email. I, I don't know if you, what do you post the email or? I, I'll put I'll put that stuff. I'll get that from you and I'll put links to that stuff in the show notes for them. And I'd love to connect with anybody who is interested in connecting because I'm down here by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Susan, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.